Well, I'd like to thank everyone for allowing me to come speak today. It's, uh, I came back here. When I originally finished residency, I wasn't interested in endocrinology, and I was a type 1 diagnosed in 1984. So, you know, we're talking about technology. Um, the cutting edge technology at that time was home blood glucose monitoring. Um, you know, 1984 when I was diagnosed, originally we were still using uh, urine dipsticks to test for urine glucose. Um, so I came through, certainly have used a lot of diabetes technology. One of my disclosures will be that I use a Medtronic pump and a Dexcom sensor. Um, and so to understand my biases from a consumer standpoint, um, but I came through residency and, you know, I wasn't interested in being an endocrinologist. Uh, but I joined the university and in their internal medicine faculty. I started doing a diabetes work um, on the inpatient side. I got to go to the American Diabetes meeting a couple of times that the hospital sponsored me. And I really said, you know what, I really do like this field. It's, uh, you know, it's, it. I certainly have a, a quite an advantage having the, you know, one of the principal diseases that we see. And so um, I said, I really shouldn't waste that resource. Um, so I went back and did the fellowship and uh, drug my family to North Carolina and back. And uh, we got back in August and we're building our clinic and it has, it has grown wonderfully. So today we're going to talk about kind of some of the updates in technology and diabetes. And we could fill a dozen lectures uh, with discussions of the use of technology and the management of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. A lot of these were centered around and developed for use in type 1 diabetes, but are certainly very applicable and often quite often used in type 2 diabetes as well. Um, we, I have limited this discussion to technologies that are currently available. Um, a lot of people in the type 1 world you know, for as far back in, as I can remember, have discussed cures and prevention and, you know, the kind of fully integrated artificial pancreas systems. Um, but I, I chose to, and that could certainly be a discussion into itself. Um, but at this point in time, we wanted to limit the discussion to uh, technologies that were available. These are things that people could use today or would be soon available. Um, there's my clicker. Come over here. So here is just a little list of current insulins because the world of diabetes medications has expanded rapidly, especially in the last, uh, you know, in the, in the 21st century. Um, so when we look at, so when I was diagnosed, you had uh, NPH and regular human insulin. NPH was considered the basal insulin, regular human insulin was your mealtime insulin. You also had bovine and pork insulin were available at those times. I remember going to diabetes camp when I, in the third grade, and I was jealous because I didn't have a little pig or a cow on my bottle, and other people <laughs> did. Uh, and I wanted one, I wanted, I can't remember whether I wanted a pig or a cow, but I wanted one of them. Um, so, you know, that's where we were. Um, uh, regular insulin as opposed to the bovine or pork being uh, fully human insulin. Um, I believe it's manufactured predominantly using uh, genetically altered yeast, but I, I'm not sure exactly which microorganism is used. Um, so the development of Humalog or lice pro insulin, uh, which was FDA approved in 1996, uh, was a revolution because it added an even faster acting mealtime insulin. Um, the, the, we added Novolog in 2000, uh, glue lysine in 2008 as part of your rapid acting basal insulins. Uh, in 2018, uh, Fiasp, also known as Faster Aspart, so an even faster version of that uh, was released as a, a even more rapid onset uh, uh, mealtime insulin. And then we also have inhaled insulin, the Afrezo. Um, in our long-acting insulin, we have Lantus, you have Levomir, and then you have the bioidentical uh, Basaglar, Glargine. Um, but we also have two new uh, 
ultra long acting basal insulins, which is Tugeo or U300 Glargine, as well as Traceba or insulin Degladec. So, and that's not even to get into the non insulin medications used in the treatment of type 2. So, the, the treatment armamentarium for diabetes has expanded tremendously. Um, we're going to focus on choices, but I did want to mention something about prices. Um, you know, we hear a lot of talk about drug prices, especially, especially insulin prices. And, uh, you know, this statistic I thought was, was really poignant was that, you know, the cost of insulin therapy to treat diabetes has risen type 1. So for a year's worth of insulin for a type 1 has risen nearly $3,000 from 2012 and through 2016. Um, so, you know, diabetes is a very expensive disease. Uh, for most of these technologies, I'm going to try to provide you with cost, um, you know, out-of-pocket cost if you were to buy them from the uh, manufacturer, um, just so you can have an idea of some of these costs. Uh, this cost is predominantly driven by increase in insulin pricing, not necessarily a shift to, um, say, these newer insulins. Um, it's mostly driven by price increases. When this insulin was released in 96, it was $50 a bottle. It's $250 a bottle now. Um, so, you know, talking about the technology, when I was diagnosed using the urine, uh, the urine dipsticks to test urine glucose, which for anybody that, you know, kind of understands that process, that only detects glucose if your blood sugar is over a certain level. For most people, that level is around 200. So anything under 200 uh, is just negative. And you, that could be a blood sugar of 25 to a blood sugar of you know, 180. Um, and so this is a, I thought this was a really interesting article on the history of blood glucose meters. Uh, we could fill a whole new talk with that. This is one of the original uh, urine uh, test strips, this kind of, or urine uh, testing for glucose. This is one in the major technological advances in the early 1900s that kind of set the standard for glucose monitoring for the next 50 years. Um, and then in 1960s, the first actual blood glucose test strip was developed um, with the first machine released in the 1970s. Um, and then it wasn't until the late 70s, early 80s to mid 80s, well, I was diagnosed in 84. So, you know, in many places it was, it was still novel to be using home blood glucose monitoring at that time. Um, so it really was, you know, in that time that where blood glucose meters became commonly seen, commonly accepted in their accuracy um, and accepted for treatment decisions. Um, this is a device that uh, most of this is, talk is not about blood glucose meters. In fact, this is the only blood glucose meter that I will discuss. There's a lot of advances um, in blood glucose meter technology and the software and the applications that they use to help people with diabetes. But this one I saw a patient use in clinic the other day and I thought it was fascinating and so I started to look it up. And a lot of these more novel uh, diabetes devices have really marketed at consumers to purchase themselves, to not go through insurance companies. And so you're actually seeing in medicine when a new product comes out, if everything goes through insurance companies, there's actually no competition. Every insulin in a class is priced essentially the, sh the same. They call that shadow pricing. And so we have a, a rise of these new devices that have come out in kind of allowing normal market forces to take shape. We're not marketing to the insurance companies. We're marketing directly to the consumer. And so this is a, a glucometer in which this is the machine. It's battery powered by your cell phone. So you plug it into the bottom of your cell phone. You have this little device that you carry in your purse and inside it, it hides this. It has a, a lancing device um, as well as your strips. So most people have their phone with them. Um, and so they take this out, they plug it in, they take a strip, they use this to you know, acquire the blood from their finger. Uh, and then they, they test their blood sugar right there on their phone and it stores it in a, 
in a, in a very nice handy system. So I think this is one of the, uh, uh, you know, fascinating little device. And it's, it's fairly accurate, as, or very accurate as well. Um, again, you can look at some of the price, $10 for 25 test strips. For those of you who don't know, most major brand test strips are going to be $30 to $35. So they're going to be somewhere around definitely over 100 cents a piece, but a lot of them around 110 to 120 cents a piece. It has some neat little things. It'll send people GPS locator signals if you want, um, if you have a low blood sugar. Um, and this was what I, I, I thought was the most interesting and why I really say that this is, you know, kind of uh, reflects a shift of, you know, marketing towards consumer driven is $20 a month you get the meter, uh, you get the support services that they offer, and you get an unlimited amount of test strips. Now, you know, I'm not sure how long that lasts, but they are marketing at non-insurance coverage. They are marketing this for people to buy out of pocket, and they've marketed it in a very reasonable manner. Um, for the average type 1 that might test their blood sugar 8 to 10 times per day, 300 strips a month, that's Eat minimum $350 for most strips if you were to buy them out of pocket. Um, this is the only other device. Most of the devices we're talking about are continuous glucose <coughs> monitors, but this was one thing that I also thought was neat and it's, it's fairly new. I've, I've not seen this yet. It's called an iPort. And basically it's take an insulin pump site. Um, so you put this site in place and then you inject into this site, it's kind of like, essentially functions like an insulin IV. So when you go into the hospital, you have an IV so that all your injections go through it and you don't get stuck each time. And this is functioning in a very similar manner. You replace it every three days because it basically it uses insulin pump technology. So this looks exactly like my insulin pump site um, with the exception that they've modified this a little bit to allow for injections. And so. Uh, there's a lot of novel things in diabetes. Some of them don't take off just because of lack of use, but um, you know, the marketing for this is that you get 10 needle sticks a month versus 150. So uh, I think that would appeal to a, a good number of people. Um, so down to the meat of our discussion, which we'll start with continuous glucose monitors or CGMs. Um, these are probably some of my personal favorite devices in the field of diabetes. Um, we'll go through the ones that are currently available um, and kind of what are their users limitations. Um, so the ones that we'll review are the Dexcom G5 and G6. The G6 is the one that I use. Uh, the Medtronic Guardian 3, uh, the Freestyle Libre Flash CGM, and the Eversense Implantable CGM. Um, so to start with what one of these devices are, so the Dexcom G5 and G6 were both Bluetooth enabled to be paired with a mobile device. So as I stand up here and I swipe my phone, oh, I see I just got an alert that my blood sugar was high. And so that's how they're enabled, so they transmit to the phone. They can also transmit to a receiver. Um, they function, let's see if this is working, they function via this catheter that sits right there. Um, that sits under the skin in the interstitial space. I kept trying to show my parents the catheter, but they couldn't, I couldn't get the light bright enough for them to see it. And I couldn't find a magnifying glass, so they never were able to see the catheter. So it's probably twice the diameter of a hair, um, but very, very small. Um, so these, sits on, these sit on the arm or abdomen or upper buttocks um, and will measure a blood glucose every five minutes. That is consistent across the CGM class that you will get a blood glucose every five minutes. Um, and then they transmit that information either to a receiver or to your mobile device. So you're not required to have a mobile device for those Luddites that don't want a cell phone. Um, but it can do either one. And if you have the Apple iWatch, it can transmit to that as well. Um, this is what we call a real-time CGM, meaning that it will provide you with alerts as you set them. So you can get alerts for high blood sugar, you can get alerts for low blood sugar, 
you get alert for rising too fast or falling too fast. Um, most people stick with high and low. You can turn off all alerts except for the very low blood glucose alert, which is at 55. Um, <clears throat> this was their this was their device and would go on here. So the G6 system does not require calibration. So it, you put it on, it goes through its two hour warm up period. The traditional uh, G5 uh, required calibration to start. So by calibration, I mean you had to check your blood sugar in the, in the typical way using a blood glucose meter. Um, and then input that blood sugar in there in order for it to start. That was how it calibrated and it required that you do that every 12 hours. So the upgrade, and the G5 is still available and a very good device, was also approved for non-adjunctive use. So originally these were approved for adjunctive use to blood glucose meters. So they were not FDA approved for making treatment decisions. And by that I mean they were not approved for adjusting your insulin doses um, and deciding what dose to give. So they were listed as adjunctive. So this one actually got approval for non-adjunctive use, meaning that the FDA said you can adjust your insulin based on that. And the Dexcom G6 has that as well. Um, it has, and these are, I will try to highlight what are consistent features across the class. Um, the alerts, the arrows that I'm about to show you are consistent features across the class. Alerts are not, arrows are. I'll point out which ones don't have alerts. So the trend arrows is one of the very significant advantages of having continuous glucose monitoring. <coughs> If you, this tells you that your glucose is stable. These diagonal area arrows mean that over the next 30 minutes your blood sugar is probably going to change less than 30 or 60. And then your, this means your blood sugar is going to change more than 60 to 90 over the next 30 minutes, or at least that's what predicted based on your current rate of change. And then this shows it's going to predicted to change more than 90 over the next 30 minutes. So those are significant changes. I mean that's a going from 150 to a 60 so that's going from a normal. So you can see what tremendous advantage having, having, that's my high glucose alert. Um, you can see what a tremendous advantage it is to have trends and what your blood glucose values are because you can come into the same meal and check your sugar and it'd be 150. But if you were rising at three points per minute or falling at three points per minute or even falling, even one of these where you're rising or falling versus being stable, what you're going to get at a four hour time period is entirely different. And we say, well, do we, you know, the, the type one diabetic patient is going through his math and saying, well, did I not count my carbohydrates correctly? Did I not give enough insulin? Is it bad insulin? Was it a bad injection site? And so there's a tremendous amount of information to be gleaned from what is the current directionality of our blood glucose values, which was never available um, prior to CGM. You got a static point in time. You know, now you know where you were five minutes ago. You know where you were for the past 24 hours, um, which is a a revolutionary change and if you act badly and your spouse you, so you can swipe and say look my sugar's low see look I have proof right here so because before when you had to stop to check your sugar they'd forgotten about it they would left and so it was way too late to get any credit so now you can get credit for that stuff and it doesn't cause you the problems that it did before maybe a little bit less um, so here's just, a, and most of these are from their site, so it just talks, I mean, it's them talking about how wonderful they are. Um, you can actually share your data. A number of these have this feature. So somebody, so this is especially true for parents. Um, so they can follow along with their children, you know, while they're at school. I would imagine that probably makes them more anxious than it actually is helpful. Um, you know, my mom sent me to school at a time where 
it was kind of the dark ages. You didn't check your sugar. You just, if you didn't fall out, you made it through the day and everybody was happy. <laughs> and, you know, if you did, then you drank a bunch of apple juice and you came back too. And, and they never, and parents never knew. And you just went on about the day. And so, um, you know, we have, you know, technology always gives us more information. Um, it doesn't. It changes the nature of our peace of mind, but it can certainly add stressors as well as taking them away. So I think that's the thing that we often neglect. Now, I certainly would not want to go back to that time just for that ignorance is bliss peace of mind because a lot of complications arose from that ignorance. Um, approved for those over two years, and the sensors last for two days. The G5 sensors were nice because they were only approved for seven days, but you could tell the system that you put in a new sensor, leave the old one in, and get 14 to 20 days out of it. Um, but I guess they figured out people could do that and said this is not a good marketing thing for people to be able to do that. Um, just to, just to, uh, I mentioned on the price. So a month of sensors is $350. Um, two transmitters is $480. This is from the Dexcom site. Um, you can get them at Amazon, kind of price, internet price will vary. So that's $80 a month. The one-time receiver is $365. Um, I've never actually turned my receiver on, so I don't think you need it just because I use the phone. Um, so that would give you a price of about $430 per month. This is not one of the companies that is marketing to consumers to buy. Um, you can tell that by their pricing. Um, so this is the kind of information you can get. This is, you know, clearly my reports. Uh, Paul wouldn't let me have his. Apparently he hasn't been doing well lately. But uh, uh, so, you know, over the 90 days, I get an average glucose. I get a standard deviation, I get a days with CGM use, so when I'm looking at these in my patients, and I get a time and range, and this range, where am I, time and range, so when I'm looking at patients' data, this, this is the first page I go to. Um, all of our sensors give us time and range data. Um, what these sensors have also taught us is that what we thought we understood about type 1 and even type 2 from a five or seven point glucose profile, meaning you know you check your blood sugar five or seven times throughout the day and label those at times, that's what we call the profile, that we really didn't. Because that's, that is how much variability we have. And that's actually probably a pretty decent week. Um, but you can just see how much variability there is. Um, and, you know, I highlight certain things because I like my patients to see the very consistent feature of a low blood sugar episode followed by high blood sugar episodes. So these each different color is a day. So you can see there's a low episode. You can follow the line straight up to a high. See it's low. You can follow it straight up to a high. And it's a very consistent feature across diabetes, type 1, type 2. Um, so these are things that we hope to be able to mitigate with these continuous glucose monitors. Um, they provide us with a tremendous amount of information. Knowing what to do with that information can be a little bit more difficult because of the variability. I mean, this is a really good week. Look at the difference between these two weeks. So if you had to make adjustments in insulin based on just these two weeks with the exact same settings and profiles, you might make entirely different adjustments. And so um, to understand the variability um, in the glucose values in these disease states. Now this is just kind of some different tracings. Um, so one of the adaptations that people have started to make um, and this is especially true for type 1's, but still applicable to insulin-dependent type 2's, is that they are not using the same insulin dose depending on what the trend arrows is. So they have used the trend arrows to incorporate, and you can see over here, this is a, from the Endocrine Society, and they've, you know, they've published adjustments based on what, and this is for the Dexcom specifically, because different platforms have different numbers associated with different arrows. And so for the Dexcom system, they've published adjustments based on, just for that reason, that a 150 going up is not the same as 150 going down. Um, and so if patients want to stay in that target range, you have to adapt to the dynamic process. So in type 1 diabetes, 
The ideal model is a model of dynamic interaction. It is not a disease in which perfection exists. It's not a disease that you're ever going to get right all the time. You know, it's kind of like a baseball batter. I mean, you want to get it right as often as you can, uh, but you're never going to be right all the time. And, you know, I try to impress upon my patients that it is a process of dynamic interaction, not being perfect, because for perfection does not exist in this. And really, you can say that for type 2 as well. Here's the next one is the Medtronic Guardian 3. Um, it's got a lot of nice features. Again, it comes to your phone. Um, this one does require uh, calibration at least every 12 hours. Um, it is approved for adjunctive use at this time, so it's not approved for insulin dosing just based on those numbers. It doesn't mean that most people won't use it for that. Um, but that's just based on the FDA approval. It also has some of the you know, remarkable changes in software, um, and one of these is the Sugar IQ app. Um, just another feature to help people with some of the many decisions that come in in the day of a life of somebody with insulin dependent diabetes. Um, they are proof for wear on the stomach and the arm. Um, so I didn't talk about accuracy. Accuracy is defined in the MARD and we're not going to go into the statistics of the mean average relative difference um, because even if I could understand and explain it to you, um, it would take up a lot of time and wouldn't be very interesting. Uh, but that is how we define our accuracy with these. So, so kind of the difference from the reference mean, and we'd like them to be under 10%. And Dexcom is about 9%. Um, you can see on this one that the, the MARD varied based on number of calibrations, age, and sight. So age didn't have as much of an influence, but sight and number of calibrations did have an influence of that. Um, and how we calibrate, most of these studies were done with um, very high quality meters, done in the right manner. We know that there can be interfering substances on the fingers. You know, kids can have food, sweets, well, kids and adults, um, you know, can have different substances on the fingertips that can influence, you know, what that, what that value is. And so um, you all like to have confidence in all the numbers that you're interacting with. Um, again, that one has, uh, has the up and down arrows. It doesn't have diagonal, it just has one, two, and three. Um, you know, I didn't mean to, to spend less time on this one, but I, yeah, I think we do need to get moving ahead. So if you wanted to buy this out of pocket, and I didn't quite understand it, they say you transmit over $700 for only let's get two months of car payments, um, and the sensors range from $50 to $75. Um, and there was different subscriptions that you could buy into where you could do kind of spread it out over time. Um, I wasn't exactly clear, but I mean the subscriptions were basically trying to spread out the cost over, over, over the course of a year, I suppose, everything up front. Um, now we get to flash glucose monitoring. This system really revolutionized and almost universalized uh, the use of continuous glucose monitoring. So this used a very inexpensive data transmission technology and so they made a a sensor that was priced in a very reasonable manner um, that people could actually buy out of pocket now it didn't wasn't real time the other two are real time glucose sensors meaning they will transmit to a device give you alerts the Libre is, and you've seen it advertised a lot, it's not a real-time device. You have to scan um, either a phone or a reader over top of it to get the numbers back, but they priced it such that it is not unreasonable to buy them out of pocket. Um, Christy, you said that out of pocket calls for... So, yeah, so Christy through the use of coupons um, that were available through GoodRx. Um, and CVS Single Care uh, was able to get them for $65 a month, which is a full 28 days worth of sensors in which you can check your blood sugar every five minutes if you would like. Um, so this has, you know, when they first released these, they had to build another factory because, you know, the people just you know, started using them like crazy. Um, initially, their accuracy was a little bit less, but the amount of insight it gave patients was sufficient that they were you know, okay, uh, 
you know, with a little less accuracy. Um, their accuracy has certainly improved, um, but this has really, you know, really made CGMs um, a common feature in the management of type 2 diabetes, where before it was really limited to type 1, hard to get approved for type 2 diabetes. Um, you could sometimes, but it was difficult. Um, and so uh, the, the introduction of the Libre sensor, a cheap, widely available sensor um, without the issues of alarm fatigue and everything else, has really had great uptake. And, and you know, my clinical experience has been that patients um, feel so enlightened and secured after having one of these sensors, able to know what their blood sugar is whenever they want without having to stop and prick their finger. So um, we've been very impressed with these. Again, all of these are measuring glucose in the interstitial fluid. So when somebody draws your blood in the hospital, they measure it from the vein. When we prick our finger, we measure it from the capillary. So not all of these compartments are always the same. If everything's nice and steady, then they're generally the same. But if things aren't perfectly steady, these systems all don't change at the same rate. Um, so just to understand, these are almost painless to go in. Both, all of these are, are almost painless. They all have inserters that are really easy to use. Um, so then this is the MARD for this one, and you can see that the new ones, the MARD, is certainly equal to the rest of the sensors. This one is approved for non-adjunctive use, which means the FDA has said you can use this one to make insulin dosing decisions. Now every one of them has a caveat. If things don't feel right to you, you need to go back and check your blood sugar um, before taking action on that. And I think that is a very smart rule that you have you have ways to to check whether the accuracy is there and I, and I think um, we always recommend our patients utilize that if you don't think something is is lining up um, again this is a good RX prices um, so for a month's supply you're looking at about $115 um, and then you can use CVS single care or is it just single care, single care. it's not through CVS Okay, so just single care is another uh, uh, drug coupon site. Um, again, the Libre still gives you trend areas, arrows, which as I mentioned before are hugely valuable. Um, let you know whether it's rising, rising a little, rising a lot, or rising a lot, rising a little, stable, falling, or falling quickly. You know, these are things that are very important. You know, you know, I'd say, you know, imagine somebody's going to get in a car and they check their blood sugar and it's 120. Well, if you know that you're falling rapidly, that's a different place than if you're nice and stable. Uh, and if you're getting in a car and you're about to go for a drive, you know, I mean, everybody knows who's been in the field of diabetes knows a type 1 or a type 2 that has died or nearly died. Um, you know, from a car accident. It doesn't happen all the time, but you know, you only have to know a few people to be, you know, mindful of the significance and importance. So again, they've developed systems for adjusting your insulin doses um, based on the trend arrows. Um, some of the potential interactions, again, the Dexcom G5 was interact interfered with by um, uh, acetaminophen. Um, this, the Libre, by high doses of aspirin, not, you know, your normal prophylactic doses, but doses over 650 milligrams, so kind of your goody powder doses, um, as well as high doses of vitamin C. So for all those who are seeing their wintertime commercials about your immune system and take high doses of vitamin C can certainly uh, have an impact on those. And different substances can make them read higher or lower. Most of the time, the substance is making them read higher, um, but one of the sensors can be impacted by uh, tetracycline antibiotics and make them read a little lower. Um, this is the one I have not seen yet. I'm hoping when I go to the Endocrine Society meeting this weekend that this company will be here and so I'll be able to reach out to them. So this is an implantable device. So it's approved for up to 90 days. So you implant this little sensor in the upper arm, basically in the area between the deltoid um, and, the, and the bicep. Um, and then you put this transmitter over top of it. The transmitter is secured with a silicone-based gel um, that 
it can be removed, reapplied. It's designed to be removed, and the tape is designed to be removed and reapplied daily. Um, so if patients don't want this visible, they can take it off for a day, two days, three days, put it back on. They take it off for a couple hours. Um, so it provides, uh, you know, uh, something that is totally different in the field uh, of CGMs in that, you know, now if you have a device and it gets removed, that device is no longer functional and you either got to call the company and see about replacing it or you're out of pocket for the cost or something. So this gives the idea of something that is, um, it, you can at least take the transmitter out. So you have the sensor that is implanted and the transmitter that sits over top of it. So um, the reference data for it has been good. Um, it provides you alerts that it sends to your phone, um, just like the other devices do. It also provides you own person alerts by vibrating if your sugar is low. So an interesting feature. But like I said, I haven't seen it yet. You're interested in you know, kind of how many times can you do this? If you're talking about 90 days, you're looking at four times a year. So. Is there a limit to how many of these that you can put in and places, et cetera? So uh, I certainly think it's very interesting and I'd like to see more of it. Um, so the benefits of CGM system. Studies have consistently shown improved glycemic control, reduction in hypoglycemia, and improvement in quality of life. So if all these things are universally good, how come everybody with diabetes doesn't have one? Um, and there are, you know, we'll kind of get into some of the reasons for that. So uh, the Type 1 Diabetes Exchange is a big national registry database of patients with Type 1 diabetes, mostly located um, from big academic centers or non-academic, but, you know, uh, significant Type 1 centers. Um, some people just don't like wearing them. Some people don't trust them. Cost is probably one of the more significant issues. Uh, a shortage of people to educate the patients. Um, like I said, mistrust is kind of lack of confidence. And they are inundated with all of this data, but it gets kind of overwhelming as to how do I adjust? How do I adapt? I'm tired of getting all these alarms. Um, you know, a lot of times when I put one of these sensors on somebody, you know, I am really minimizing alarms so that they don't just chunk it out the window um, because, you know, patients, you know, the stories of patient after patient show that people can get very frustrated when you get this endless series of alarms from a device um, and so it can reduce usage. All right, we got five minutes. So these are just some of these things. We're going to go over all that. All right, pumps available in the U.S. Um, like I said, I've been on an insulin pump since... 1996 in December, so it'll be 23 years in December. Um, I've always used a Medtronic, but I think all the brands, I've worn all of them, and I think they are all wonderful devices that we have on the market now. Um, they have all consistently shown to lower A1C, improve glycemic values in randomly selected patients on shots. Now, it does not make a person who is thriving on injections do any better. Um, so if somebody's doing well on injections, I do not encourage them to change what they are doing. Um, and so they can be used, they are predominantly used in type 1. Um, but certainly you have plenty of usage of these in your insulin dependent patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, it is becoming uh, less difficult to get these approved, especially through Medicare. So certainly something that is you know, not uncommonly seen in the type 2 diabetic patients. Um, we're going to go through a little of these, some of the, uh, you know, this is just some of the history stuff. Um, you know, 50% from the exchange in 12, 50% of adult type 1s had a pump. So that was still 44% that did not. I um, suspect that that number's a little higher now, but I don't know. All right, one of the really nice features about um, the insulin pump is the online bolus calculator and so or inboard. So when you are at type 1 or insulin dependent type 2 and you're going to calculate your dose for a meal, clearly I didn't do it well for that one. Um, but like we always say, type 1 is never perfect because I was nervous, cortisol levels are higher, glycemic response is going to be different to a meal than if I'd have been 
relax, normal, everything the same. So response times are, you know, that's why I always tell people type 1 is an unpredictable illness. You just, your process of doing it well is to react to what changes, uh, not to be able to predict everyone correct. So if we were going to say, all right, I mean, we have an 85 grams of carbohydrates. So first of all, you had to go through the mental process of counting up and adding those carbohydrates together, unless it came in a neat little package. Um, then you have to take your carbohydrate ratio and divide that by that and figure out how many units for the carbs that you're going to take. So when I first got a pump, I had one of those calculator watches. Um, and so that's how I figured out my doses. So then you look at your blood sugar. We say, all right, if our blood sugar is 225, we clearly want to take more insulin than if our blood sugar is 150. So we subtract 150 from 225. That's 75. We divide it by our correction factor, we get three units. So that's 10 units. Now, mentally, we could never subtract the insulin on board time. So what I'm highlighting with all this is kind of the complexity of coming up with a mealtime dose for a patient with type 1 diabetes. I mean, Paul, you remember doing this stuff. Yeah, I, you know, you almost had to have a notepad half the time. But you didn't have a notepad because you only knew used numbers that were easy to add. You used 10, you used 15, you used 5. Um, you, you only use numbers that made math easy. Uh, and so the pumps, all of them have all those preset information stored in there so that you put in the carbs, you put in your blood sugar, it adjusts, it calculates the dose, including looking at how much insulin is active in your body right now, and then gives you a dose and gives it. So it does a lot to make that process easier. And we know consistently that patients that use that feature of their pumps, technology doesn't necessarily, or most of the time, does not automatically make control better. If people don't want to interact with the technology, it's no better than you know, what they were using before, sometimes even worse. Um, and so, but if people use that technology that is embedded within those systems, they do better. And we know that from studies. So, Getting on to the kind of fancier stuff, the ultimate ideal of the artificial pancreas, the closest we are right now is a single system that has approval for the hybrid closed loop. Um, this is Medtronic system. Um, so their sensor, what it does when you're in auto mode or hybrid closed loop, um, is that it adjusts the basal rate based on what your blood glucose values are to help maintain you in a target range. So bring your blood sugar down if it's high, bring your blood sugar up if it's low. And it can only bring your blood sugar up by stopping insulin, it can only bring it down by giving more insulin. Um, so this was the first FDA approved. Now the FDA put a lot of uh, safety requirements and so if at all the system feels uncomfortable, then it will kick you out and you will go back to kind of normal pump functioning. Um, but this was certainly a big advancement. Um, again, it started with the pump's ability to stop the insulin flow for up to two hours, um, you know, if it predicted or at that time if the blood sugar was low. So in case somebody didn't wake up, it didn't continue insulin delivery. Um, I'm just going to go through and show you the rest of the pumps um, and then we'll kind of get past that. Here's the T-Slim X2. It now has basal IQ technology. So it paired with the Dexcom G6 has the technology that it will stop it if your blood sugar is low or it predicts your blood sugar is going to become low in the next period of time. So where that can be really fascinating, had a patient come see me, her basal rate is set at 23 and a half units per day. She's on this nice system and she's excellently controlled and we see that it's stopping her so that on average she's getting 20 units of basal per day. So what it allows us to do is go back and say, well why leave it at 24 and rely on the system? Let's just move it back to what you get every day anyway. So we moved it back to 20 and we reduced the number of times that it had to suspend to prevent a low blood sugar. So, um, it, so this is really, uh, you know, a, a nice device. This is a touch screen device, um, a little bit more in line with some of the modern technology. But again, they're all really good pumps. Um, this summer they are expected to have um, the full control IQ. So they're hybrid closed loop. And they're called hybrid closed loop because these things cannot predict when you're going to eat. 
And even though these insulins are rapid acting, the peak action time of the insulins is at 60 minutes, sometimes even a little further. And so you have to still put in how much food you're eating and what your blood sugar is. Um, and so that's why they're called hybrid closed loop because it adjusts the background to kind of keep you, to get you down a little bit or get you up a little bit, but it's not going to adapt to everything that happens in your life. You need to let it know if you're going to exercise. So it, it is still a device, but um, so that is supposed to be released this summer. Um, the, uh, the last one, the last pump available is the Omnipod. Um, this has some very unique features. It makes it very popular. It has no tubing, um, which patients love. It also has no needle that you see. So if we go up here, that's the pod. So you fill it with insulin, you put it on there, and you press a button, and it inserts the needle without you ever seeing it. Uh, and it's not very... It's kind of minimally painful. I don't know if I felt any pain at all. Um, but a lot of patients like that you really don't have to go through the process of shooting a needle in yourself at all. You just press a button and it takes care of it and it's really a fascinating little device. It's waterproof, uh, certainly good for water sports. Um, and it, it's hybrid closed loop technology. I don't know when it will be available. There are some published pilot studies showing it, but I don't have any idea when it will be out. Um, so that leaves us enough time for some questions. I know we had to run through the stuff pretty quickly at the end. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to talk about, but certainly give us some time for questions and we can ask about things that weren't in the discussion. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what's your opinion on using uh, type 2 uh, oral medications uh, in addition to <clears throat> All right, so the question was, what is my opinion on the use of oral type 2 medications? And I'm going to go ahead and specify, Paul, to the SGLT2 inhibitor class of medications in type 1 diabetes. So the normal kidney spills glucose in the urine at around 180. The diabetic kidney uh, kind of works against you and starts to spill glucose at a higher level. Somewhere, depending on the person, somewhere around 210, 215. I think it's about as high as it goes uh, based on what I've read. Um, and so these medications block the predominant glucose reabsorber within the nephron. And so you start to pee out glucose um, at a blood sugar of around 100. So most patients are peeing out between 250 and 300 calories per day. This is not a mechanism that requires the use of insulin in order to lower the blood sugar. Also has a benefit of lowering blood pressure even though it's not FDA approved for that as well as um, having patients lose weight. Now it tends to increase appetite so the weight loss is kind of static at about five pounds. They've kind of looked at why it doesn't happen. But there's a there's an increasingly large number of trials looking at the use of this medication, this class of medications in type 1 diabetes. Um, I know of two very large year-long studies that were published this year. Um, the concern has always been that they've typically seen a DKA rate with the use of these medications that is on average two to fourfold higher than the placebo group. So placebo group would be around 1%, these would be around 3 or 4%. Um, you know, for the right patient that can react, I think they're wonderful because their, their improvements in glycemic control um, are clearly demonstrated in every study. Um, you know, the risk of DKA uh, has to be taken into account. Uh, I personally, I've had remarkable success since adding one of those to my, my regimen. Um, and I will present patients with the evidence surrounding those. Um, but somebody needs to be very savvy um, with their diabetes and learn when to recognize when they might be in DKA with a blood sugar that might only be 180 or 200 because you have an agent that prevents you from rising higher and how to react to that. So in the appropriate patient, they can be very, very useful. You have a question? Yes, ma'am. What, uh, what of these newer pumps will the uh, Medicare approve? That is a very good question. I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, I'm almost positive that approval for those, at least the Tandem and the Medtronic, goes through DME um, and is... 
if they approve one, they approve the other. They don't specify. Sometimes companies try to get fancier by moving the category with which their device is in, um, and so they can can be a little sneakier. Um, you know, pumps were becoming more and more commonly used in type two, um, but then. Uh, we had a wave of new medicines and you know mostly centered around the uh, glucose like peptide or glucagon like peptide uh, one agonist and which really had such a profound impact on the control of type 2 diabetes that uh, you know talking to reps in the field and what I kind of would notice is my own interpretation has seen a, a rather uh, marked decrease in the in the use of pumps because people have been able to control their glucose with less insulin injections, and so um, so that's really made a difference. But yes. Well, what, what has been your experience in using uh, dietary things as an adjunct for managing things? I mean, like you know, a lot of short uh, uh, meals that are you know not heavy meals versus large meals. Dietary modification can be tremendous benefit. So I tell a story of one of my favorite patients that was on about 80 units of insulin per day. Um, A1Cs were 12, 13, 14. As most of y'all know, those are extremely elevated. You do not want your A1C to be in high school. Um, you want it to be in elementary school. Um, and so she, and it all depends on the phenotype, so type two, is a, a number of different diseases. I would say there's probably at least three or four different phenotypes within that group. Um, but she fell into the young insulin resistant phenotype. She got pregnant, changed her diet, and went from 80 units a day in an A1C of 13 to an A1C of five and a half on no insulin per day. Um, and that was with, you know, the young insulin resistant type twos are the ones that really benefit the most markedly, but everyone benefits. You know, we have all this technology for type one, but all this technology is still hard to keep up with eating huge sugar loads. Um, it's even for the type one. So, you know, a, a reasonable diet um, for a type one is going to make control easier. You know, reducing the number of carbs. There's a lot of type ones that have gone really low carb and had great success with it. Um, a lot of people don't want to do that, and I don't think there's any reason to do it. Nothing's universal, but if it works for you, um, then it's a good system. Uh, and type 2, especially if anything, you know, can induce weight loss, um, it is generally going to be very helpful. Um, but a lot of the times it is removing the worst of the offenders. Um, because for some very insulin resistant people, you know, a single coat can be worth 10 or 15 units, um, you know. So it's, uh, if you can, it has a huge impact. Probably, you can make a bigger impact with lifestyle modifications than you can with most medications. You know, all, you know, patient variety taking into account that nothing is ever universal in, type, in diabetes, but in general, you make a huge impact. Yes, sir. Sir, sure. Terrible stories about individuals who are foregoing um, their insulin medication because of the cost and making sure they can feed their families instead of taking the insulin. What, what's the reason why the insulin, the cost of insulin, has increased so dramatically? Uh, it kind of follows the traditional uh, big business model. Um, you know, if you can make more money, then do it. Uh, and there, I mean, there's really no manufacturing reason. Um, the argument has been that because of the price reduction they have to give to third party distributors, that so they have to raise the price. But, you know, I mean, Humalog came out at $50 a bottle and now it's $250. It might even be higher than that now. Um, you know, the cost of manufacturing has not risen um, fivefold during uh, that 20 year span. Um, you know, the CEO of the company that uh, jacked the price of uh, the EpiPens up, you know, got a $25 million bonus that year. I mean, there is a lot of financial incentives for the people at top to do that. Um, and I think these insulin drugs make a lot of money for the companies and they drive a lot of R&D and development in other areas. Um, but it certainly hits people hard. And, 
you know, I mean, it's, it's so hard because you might go to one pharmacy and your insulin cost you $800 and you go to another pharmacy and it's fully covered. Or, you know, your doctor wrote Novolog and it's $300 because it's all formulary because Humalog is on your formulary and it's $25. And so, you know, in an ideal world, you know, we, you know, we try to make sure to ask most patients, how much are you spending a month on your diabetes medications? Because a lot of times the biggest expenditures are on the least valuable medicines. And so we like to make sure that if you're paying for a medicine, it is of significant value to you. I mean, if you're paying a lot for it. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, you hear a lot of stories of that. And that's, and that's not, I mean, we, you know, we hear some version of that story almost every day. It's, uh, it's most catastrophic in the type ones because they often end up in DKA. We try to make people know that you can buy bottles of insulin without a prescription Different states depends on what kind you can buy, but just about every state you can buy insulin without a prescription from the pharmacy. And then the regular and NPH rely on brand from Walmart being $25 a bottle. So um, as the only brand of insulin that is under $100 a bottle. Well, good. Well, thank you all for coming. I hope it was uh, uh, enjoyable.